Welcome to the Chapter 6, Part 2 lecture. In this lecture, we're going to continue talking about eukaryotic cells, but this time we're going to talk about the membranous organelles. You should use the information in this lecture to complete the Chapter 6, Part 2 notes, which, of course, you should complete before you attend class. The plasma membrane, or cell membrane, surrounds the entire exterior of the cell, and it helps the cell decide who comes in and who leaves. It also helps the cell communicate with its neighbors. Now this plasma membrane also extends inside the cell, especially in eukaryotic cells, and makes up what we know as the membranous organelles. Membranous organelles are either going to be made of plasma membrane, or will be surrounded by a layer or two of plasma membrane. The plasma membrane or cell membrane is mainly going to be made of these molecules known as phospholipids, which we discussed in chapter 5. Just to refresh your memory, remember that the phospholipid has two basic regions, a very polar head with a phosphate group and two nonpolar tails. When you put enough of these phospholipids together, you can get a double membrane. There's one layer, there's another layer. We refer to this as the phospholipid bilayer. This slide is here to remind you of a couple of important things about the plasma membrane. First, that the membrane does in fact surround the entire cell. Often in diagrams, we show this membrane as being a little slice, but it surrounds everything. The second thing you should remember about this membrane is that because the phospholipids are not connected together, this membrane is actually a fluid. Here it's being shown as kind of a sphere, but cells aren't always spherical, they have different shapes. However, it isn't the cell membrane that determines the shape of the cell. It's actually proteins inside the cell that determine this, or the shape of the cell wall on the outside, if we're talking about a plant cell or a fungal cell. The endomembrane system is a group of membranous organelles that work together to produce products in bulk. So this system is like an assembly line in a factory, and it's going to produce a lot of a particular type of product. Oftentimes that product is an extracellular product, that means it's going to be released to the outside of the cell. For instance, the hormone insulin might be produced inside a pancreatic cell, but released into the blood outside the cell. Other times the product is going to stay inside the cell and be used by the cell itself. The endomembrane system includes several different organelles. It includes the nucleus, which holds the information for making the product, the ER, where the product is actually made, the Golgi body, where the product is finished and packaged, vesicles, which deliver this product between the organelles, and the plasma membrane on the outside of the cell, which eventually will release the product into the extracellular environment. DNA to RNA and RNA to protein is the central dogma of modern biology. This is the pathway that cells have to follow in order to manufacture proteins. The endomembrane system can make a number of different types of molecules, but proteins are going to be the major product. The organelles of the endomembrane system are what allow this pathway to happen. Let's say we want to make a protein like insulin to be exported from the cell. The instructions for the insulin will be stored inside the nucleus in the DNA. The machinery of the cell will make a Xerox copy of that DNA, and that will be a molecule of RNA. That RNA can leave the nucleus through a nuclear pore and join up with a ribosome. Ribosomes are little machines that will read the piece of RNA and use it to put together the right amino acids into the protein that we want to make. The first major component of the endomembrane system is the nucleus. 
the nucleus is the storehouse for the DNA. Now remember that the DNA holds the instructions for making other molecules that we want to make, specifically things like RNAs and proteins. So let's say that in this instance we want to make a lot of insulin. Insulin's a protein and we want to export it from the cell and release it into the blood. The first thing we need to do is go into the nucleus and access that DNA. Because the nucleus holds the DNA and stores all the recipes for making all these great proteins, we can think of it as being kind of like a library inside the cell or the hall of records. It holds the information. Now, as you might imagine, not just anybody can go waltzing into the nucleus or come waltzing out with whatever they want. There's a pretty tight security system around that library of information. On the outside of the nucleus, we have this special membrane known as the nuclear envelope, and it's actually two layers thick. In order to get in and access the DNA, the chromatin that's inside, or to bring a product out, you have to go through the double membrane. To do this, you can access these little things. These things that look like rubber daisies on the outside of this ball, those are actually nuclear pores. And these pores are very large and they can open and close if the molecule has the right security clearance to get in or out. Another important region of the nucleus is the nucleolus. Here it looks like a little rubber ball inside the nucleus. The nucleolus isn't actually a little rubber ball inside the nucleus. It is a very busy place though. There's a lot of construction going on in this area and a lot of molecules, so it stains very darkly under the microscope. The nucleolus is a factory for making ribosomes. Now ribosomes are something that all cells have. They have to have them in order to make other proteins. So this is a really important region of the cell. In this area, RNA is combined with proteins to make the ribosomes, and the instructions for those ribosomes are held in the DNA. Sometimes cells will have more than one nucleolus, in which case we call them nucleoli. Ribosomes aren't technically membranous organelles, but they're often found attached to membranes, so we'll talk about them here. Ribosomes are made of RNA and proteins kind of mushed together. They're made of these two subunits. This one's called a large subunit, and the smaller one is called the small subunit. And it looks kind of like a burger or kind of like a snowman without a head. This little machine makes proteins for the cell. And so again, this is something that all cells have to have to survive. Two categories of ribosomes can be found inside cells. First, we have free ribosomes. Free ribosomes just float around in the cytoplasm, and they tend to make proteins that are going to stay inside the cell. So these are proteins that cells need for just everyday functioning, just staying alive. Other ribosomes may be found attached to membranes. For instance, these guys are attached to a membrane called the ER, and they tend to make proteins that are going to be exported from the cell. So when we're talking about making insulin to release into the blood, that's mainly going to be these membrane-bound ribosomes that do that job. The endoplasmic reticulum, or ER, is attached to the nucleus. It's essentially a giant sheet of plasma membrane that's been folded back and forth and back and forth on itself to form this giant fan-like structure. Inside the little pockets of this fan-like structure, different chemical reactions can occur. So the ER is capable of making lots of different molecular products, including proteins and lipids and others. There are two different kinds of ER, which we'll discuss next. So let's say that we're still working on our little insulin protein. The instructions for the insulin are going to be stored in the nucleus inside the DNA. A Xerox copy of that DNA has already been made. That's a little piece of RNA. That RNA molecule can leave the nucleus through a pore, and it's going to go out and find a ribosome. 
In this case, the ribosome is going to be attached to the ER because presumably we're going to make a lot of insulin to export from the cell. The ribosomes on the ER are going to take that RNA, read it, and use that information to build the amino acid sequence for insulin. This is really silly, but whenever I think of the ER, I think of peanut butter. You know how there's two different kinds of peanut butter? There's chunky and smooth? Well, there's two different types of ER. There's rough and smooth. Now remember rough, don't put chunky ER on a test. Rough ER looks rough under the microscope. It's covered with all these little dots, and these dots are ribosomes. So that's why it looks rough under the scope. Remember that ribosomes make proteins. They're little protein-making machines. So what that tells us is that a whole lot of protein production can happen in the rough ER. The smooth ER, on the other hand, does not have ribosomes on it. It looks kind of gloopy and smooth under the microscope. So it's not going to be responsible for making a lot of proteins. The smooth ER is folded a little differently than the rough ER. It kind of forms these little tubes. It ends up looking a little bit like a piece of coral. If the smooth ER doesn't make proteins, then what does it do? Well, it does a lot of other things. It's responsible for breaking down lipids for energy. It breaks down sugars like glycogen into glucose, also for energy. It can also make lipids, such as cholesterol, hormones, and others. In fact, this is where the plasma membrane is manufactured inside the cell. It also has areas inside that can help detoxify drugs and carcinogens. Carcinogens, incidentally, are cancer-causing chemicals that are produced naturally by cells. And in certain types of cells, such as muscle cells, the smooth ER stores calcium. So it has a lot of different jobs. It's a kind of an advanced chemical factory. At this point in the process, the ribosomes on the ER have put together the amino acid sequences we need to make insulin. However, the insulin isn't quite ready to export yet. It needs to be finished. It needs to visit the Golgi apparatus before it leaves the cell. The Golgi apparatus is a big sheet of membrane that's been folded into kind of a big sack. And the sack has lots of little like nooks and crannies in it where different chemical reactions can happen. The insulin proteins will enter this Golgi, and as it travels through this cavernous interior, different things are going to happen to it. It might be folded, it might be modified in a certain way, or other molecules might be added to it, such as carbohydrates. When it's all finished up, it will be placed inside a little bubble that will have kind of a molecular uh, tag on it, and then that little bubble will be sent wherever it needs to go, whether that be inside the cell, for use inside the cell, or whether it be to the plasma membrane to be exported. So the Golgi body is kind of the pack and ship of the cell, or it's like a finishing plant for a particular product. Vesicles are really simple little organelles, but they're very, very important. Vesicles tie the entire endomembrane system together and help it function. Very simply, vesicles are little pieces of plasma membrane. They're little bubbles, and they serve as packages. Different products will be placed inside vesicles. They can be sent to different areas of the cell. And then whenever they can contact another piece of membrane, they can kind of turn themselves inside out and release that product into the proper area. This occurs because that plasma membrane is a liquid. It can pinch off these little bubbles, and little bubbles can fuse with it as well. So here's that whole endomembrane system all put together. We start with the information in the nucleus. A piece of RNA is made. That RNA travels out to a ribosome, wherever that happens to be. That ribosome makes the product. The product gets packaged into a vesicle. The vesicle travels to the Golgi. The product then travels through the Golgi, gets packaged into another vesicle, and then here's the vesicle turning itself inside out and releasing our insulin out into the extracellular space. So again, it works as kind of a factory system or an assembly line system, and things have to occur in a certain order in order to make the product we want.
Lysosomes are probably my second favorite cellular organelle because they're kind of cool and fairly dangerous. Lysosomes are basically little vesicles, little bubbles of membrane, and they're made by the Golgi, but their contents are pretty unique. Lysosomes contain digestive enzymes, specifically hydrolytic enzymes. So these are enzymes that perform hydrolysis. They break stuff down. In other words, a lysosome is like a little package of stomach acid, and these little packets float around inside the cell. Now, why in the world would you want that inside your cells? Well, these guys break down debris. So they wander around in the cell, and anytime they find garbage, um, they suck it in, and they break it down, and they recycle it. They also perform an, an important protective function to the cell. If things like bacteria or viruses get inside cells, these lysosomes will surround them and spray their enzymes at them and try to kill them. So they're a really important part of the cell. They keep it clean and keep it healthy. Transportation through the endomembrane system in a eukaryotic cell starts in the nucleus. The nucleus is like a cow. DNA contains genetic information about a cell, and this information lives in the nucleus just like milk lives in a cow. Genetic information from DNA is transcribed into messenger RNA, which carries this information outside the nucleus. In the same way, a bucket carries the cow's milk away from the cow. Messenger RNA travels to ribosomes in the endoplasmic reticulum, and the ribosomes translate the messenger RNA into proteins. Similarly, a milk bucket travels to a factory where it is turned into cheese. This process of transcribing DNA into RNA and then translating RNA into proteins is biology's central dogma. New proteins are packaged in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. They pinch off in a transport vesicle and travel to the Golgi apparatus. In the same way, the new cheese is packaged and taken out of the factory. The transport vesicle fuses with the receiving end of the Golgi apparatus where the proteins are modified for distribution. The Golgi apparatus is like a post office, which packages the cheese until it's ready to be mailed somewhere. After processing, the proteins are pinched off in a transport vesicle at the distribution end of the Golgi apparatus. Similarly, the cheese leaves the post office in a mail truck. After this, the transport vesicle might travel to the cell membrane, fusing with it and releasing its contents outside the cell. Just the same, the mail truck might deliver its cheese to a customer's house. Alternatively, if the proteins are digestive enzymes, they might leave the Golgi apparatus in a lysosome, ready to digest food or engulf and recycle damaged organelles. Vacuoles are kind of like vesicles, but they're a lot larger, and vacuoles are used to store things. Inside plant cells, for instance, we have the central vacuole. Look how gigantic this thing is, and it's there to store water specifically. Now, plant cells have central vacuoles, but animal cells do not, so you won't find a really gigantic vacuole like that in our cells. We tend to have smaller vacuoles, things like food vacuoles, that store food particles and other kinds of molecules. Some cells also have things called contractile vacuoles, like this little paramecium. This is a contractile vacuole. It's kind of star-shaped. What this thing does is it takes up water as water seeps into the cell, and it gets big and round. Once it's full, it can contract, as the name implies, and it sprays the water back out into the environment. So it acts like a little bilge pump or a water pump for the cell, and it helps it maintain its homeostasis. There are a couple of membranous organelles that help provide the cell with energy, and that's pretty important. The first of these is known as a mitochondrion, which would be singular, or mitochondria is plural. A mitochondrion is pretty easy to recognize because it has two membranes. It's got one on the outside, and then it has one on the inside that's folded back and forth and back and forth, so it has this kind of stripey appearance, kind of tiger stripey. Now inside this mitochondrion, there's a really important metabolic pathway that's going to take place. It's known as cellular respiration. In cellular respiration, a mitochondrion takes in molecules such as glucose, and it transfers the energy into ATP molecules. Now you'll remember from a previous lecture that ATP is the energy money of the cell. 
So without ATP, the cell will pretty quickly die. In fact, there's an entire category of diseases known as mitochondrial diseases in which the mitochondria are not functioning properly, and it can cause all kinds of problems in the body. Look it up if you're interested. The second major energy harvesting organelle found inside cells is known as the chloroplast. Now animal cells don't have chloroplast, but plant cells do. Plant cells have both mitochondria and chloroplasts. Chloroplasts perform photosynthesis. This is the act of taking sunlight and capturing that energy inside glucose. So it captures it inside sugars. Now chloroplasts are green in color. Why is that? Well, they contain these membranes called thylakoids, and on those thylakoids you can find this pigment chlorophyll. The chlorophyll helps the, the chloroplast capture the sun's energy, and it's green in color, so that's why chloroplasts are green. You probably remember seeing some chloroplasts under the microscope in the LED cells that you looked at in lab. <laughs> 